Welcome everyone to uh, this broadcast of Ascend TV, Life on the Autism Spectrum. I'm Keith Halperin. And I'm Will Burnick. And today our topic is autism and loneliness. And our guest is Michelle Garcia Winner, SLP, founder and CEO of Social Thinking. It's not about just who wants to be with me. It really starts with who do I want to be with? Who's a person, what type of person is attractive to personalities attractive to me? And um, is it reasonable for me to reach out and try to be friends with this person? So for example, if you're in middle school and you're, you've newly arrived in junior high or middle school, depending on where you live in the country, you just, you might see a really cool kid who's, you know, about to graduate from middle school, that may not be a good person to connect with, right? There's just so much difference between you newly arriving and your level of maturity versus this other kid. So it's about making a lot of choices around that. So we observe, and then one of the challenges in the social world is anxiety, social anxiety, as was mentioned. And so I became really intrigued with that because so many of my students, as I worked with them, as a if they had self-awareness, and this is important because on the autism spectrum, there's a difference in how we react and respond in the world if we have self-awareness of how people may be perceiving us and if we don't. And if we don't have self-awareness, um, we often are more literal. We're struggling to interpret the social world. And the, the reality is, is that people notice that. And often kids are really kind to people who don't, who are not making sense of the social world, but not always, right? So we have to think about bullies. But what you will find is if somebody is really struggling on the autism spectrum, they don't have self-awareness, they may appear awkward in some ways to others, there are people who will protect them, right? And so they will stand up and tell other people, you know, to get away or being a jerk or whatever that is. The more typical you appear in the lens of other people, the more you appear to blend in to whatever we call this neurotypical world, uh, the higher standards we hold for you, the less we tolerate a social difference at times, if I can speak bluntly about this. And so that group has a lot of social anxiety. But the reality is we all have social anxiety. So I was at a conference and there was about 500 people and I asked um, the audience, and I, I actually asked this question quite a bit to different audiences around the world, is who in the audience has never had social anxiety? And usually no one raises their hand. Everyone's had social anxiety, except this one conference in Boston, about 500 people, and this one woman raises her hand in the back of the room. So I call her and I go, you've never had social anxiety? And she said, no. And I go, wow, how do you do that? And she says, I don't know. And I said, well, that's remarkable. You're the first person I've ever met who does never experience social anxiety. And then the conference had a break about a half hour later, and I'm standing in, in the group talking to people in the lobby. And this woman who said she had no social anxiety, you know, found me standing there and she goes, Michelle, I've got to talk to you. And I go, hi, you know, what's up? And she goes, I don't know what I was saying that I've never had social anxiety. Of course I've had social anxiety. I'm even anxious talking to you right now about that. So what that means is all over the world, I've asked this question and there's not a single person in the world that hasn't had social anxiety. Now the question is, how do you help individuals who've had social anxiety? And so I've worked on that as well, especially as it relates to people with social learning challenges. Thank you very much, Michelle. I now understand that uh, Stacy Kennedy, our uh, social uh, and cultural correspondent, <laughs> no pun intended, <laughs> and uh, Jennifer Brooks will have a few questions for our guest. Stacy, thanks, Keith. Yeah, I, you know, I, all the. All this information is just amazing and how like um and my question i would say uh, related to that or so like aside from self uh you know having self-awareness or eventually like having that i mean would you say it's very common within within what you're saying that especially with generalizing and personalizing with most on the spectrum i mean that's like different languages to them like as well and 
and hopefully like yeah there's groups that will you know will get that and some that don't but the group that does get it that would that talk up with them saying you know they they thought you meant this or that or thinking you know that would, would you say that's very common too with when it comes to generalizing and personalizing because i know i've been through that um i'm not quite sure what your question is does it mean is it that we make sense to each other or yeah yeah it, yeah like in general but sometimes you know they're like oh do they actually mean me you know kind of thing i mean i think that you know, that could be very common and like you know and relate to so really the social world's quite confusing yeah. And it's, it's quite confusing for everybody at times. Like, does that person want to be friends with me? Are they talking to me? Like, you know, we don't often say their name, right? Yeah. We don't say, Joe, I want to talk to you. Mm -hmm. We just kind of look over at Joe and start talking to him, mm -hmm. you know, or like if you're standing in line and you're just stuck there, you kind of turn around and you look towards a person and they may be doing something, but then you, you just, you know, right now, one of the big problems is everyone's looking at their phone all the time, mm -hmm. right? It's a huge issue in terms of developing relationships. The world is getting lonelier. There's a relationship between how much we stand staring at our phones when we're around people and how lonely we feel. And so in that process, one of the things I'm trying to do is build this awareness of what does it mean when we're around people, how do we want people to perceive us? And one of the things we do when we're insecure is we absolutely pick up our phone and stare at it. And all of a sudden, you know, then less and less people are talking to us. We don't seem interested in others. Others are, we don't think others are interested in us. So now it creates a self-fulfilling prophecy that also just exacerbates social anxiety. Um, and once we feel socially anxious, then we're even less likely to take the risk to relate to people. So if I can do this, I wanna share with you um, our spirals of anxiety and spirals of uh, social failure. This was named by my students and people over the years have said, you should never call something failure but my students are like, no, don't change the name because to us, it feels like failure. So just call it that. So this is what I want to show you. And so one of them is the spiral of social success. Sorry, I'm having a hard time. There we go. Spiral of social success. You have a social expectation. So for example, um, let's talk about, uh, let's see, we're all adults in this. Let, let's talk about uh, being at work. We can talk about being at work or being at school. So let's start with being at work. So um, I'm at work. I know the people around me. Um, everybody seems pretty friendly. Uh, they all say hi to me, which makes me feel awkward. I don't know why people are saying hi to me. I'm just doing my job. And so we're trying to teach them the expectation is to Greet people when you come into work in the morning, whoever you see, say hi to them. Okay, so there's the social expectation. Now, I re rely on my inner coach because I may feel uneasy about doing that, but I'm like, oh, remember, people like it when you appear friendly to them. That makes them feel comfortable. And I actually know how to do this. I know how to um, say hi to people. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Um, so I know how to do it. I try to keep my emotions calm. I attempt the task and I teach my brain I can do it because I was successful. And so I can do that again next time. And I do this circular, you know, it just is a go signal because once I know how to do it, I can meet that expectation that others hold for me. And in fact, if I think about myself, I actually like it when people say hi to me. Um, it makes me feel included. So the spiral of social failure is, I doubt my ability. I don't think people want this from me. So I make excuses. I tell myself, I'm here to work. I don't need to be talking to anybody else. Nobody wants to be with me anyway. My self-defeating comments. Um, I've had bad experiences with people that can be frustrating. I avoid trying and I give myself proof that I can't do it. So therefore, I'm not going to do it. So that's the spiral of social failure. Um, these two spirals have been, real. these are spirals. So the spiral of social failure is about social anxiety. 
the spiral of social success, you may still have social anxiety, but you push yourself to succeed towards your goal. If your goal is to appear somewhat friendly to those you work or go to school with, even if you feel a little bit anxious saying hi to somebody, uh, as you walk by, you do that. Uh, what I also wanted to say, though, as using this example of saying hi, is I've worked with a number of folks on the autism spectrum who've really never learned to how to say hi. There's so much happening in that moment. You're walking by someone. How do you figure out when's the right moment to say hi? Because it's a fleeting moment. The bodies have to cross in a certain position at the time you look towards the person and acknowledge them. And so um, don't we should never take it for granted that someone has the ability or struggles with saying hi. And so I, you know, certainly my my clients are my best teachers. The books I read are not my best teachers. It's really about working with people and experiencing them, finding out what they want. So I definitely, actually yesterday, by coincidence, a young man came over for coffee at my house. He was one of my clients for a number of years. I met him in uh, when he was in junior high and worked with him through high school. He thought people saying hi to each other was absolutely ridiculous. He thought it was stupid. He wasn't doing it. He had no one to talk to at school. It was a total self-fulfilling prophecy. And so we broke it down. How do you say hi? I was never taught to teach someone how to say hi. You just try to figure it out. What is it when we walk by each other? Where is the distance on this? What do you do with your head? You don't have to vocalize a word. You can just give a wave. What do you want yourself? Make choices and then practice it and practice it. Um, but when we get to the failure part, we're like, this is stupid. Why should anybody have to do this for each other? Um, I'm happy by myself, even though this person's quite depressed, you know, and so one of the journeys in creating these spirals was to help people not only understand the steps, but to have conversations about what are our expectations we have for others? What do I think the expectations others have for me? And then how do I meet that expectation if I feel like it's important? And I will say that if nobody talks to you, if nobody greets you and you don't greet or talk to anybody else, you may become quite advanced in different aspects of learning, but it's very, very likely you're going to become incredibly anxious and likely massively depressed because humans need each other. We need to have somebody who's actually aware that we exist in whatever culture community that we're part of in terms of school, different parts of the school day, different parts of our work setting. And so this is something that um, these two spirals actually turned out to be quite helpful uh, to, the, to my clients and continue to be helpful. And it's information that we wanna continue to share. And on that note, um, myself and my partners, uh, we write a lot of articles and all of our articles are free on our website. We do webinars that are free on our website. The live, what we call a live stream is what we charge for, but we post all this free information. We are literally just flipping to a new website. So if you have any trouble on our website in the next week or two, please come back, but notice our free articles. And there's an article that I have written that's written all about these spirals. What is your favorite part about working in social thinking? Learning from my clients, relating to my clients and learning from my clients. We're constantly learning from each other. That's part of the social world, but they help me to learn what I could possibly teach and how to teach it. And if the way I'm teaching it is successful or need to modify it. Thank you very much, Michelle Garcia Winner, for our really informative and valuable talk. We'll now hear from Jennifer Brooks, our book correspondent. Oh, hello everyone. We have just had a fascinating conversation with our guest, Michelle Winner, about the subject of social thinking. Michelle has written many books on the subject of social thinking. And one of them is called, You Are a Social Detective, Explaining Social Thinking to Kids. 
And I believe it's very important to explain social thinking to kids. When I was a child, no one ever explained social thinking to me. So I was always confused about why I always seem to have the wrong understanding about a certain situation. And it's important for children to understand the concepts of social thinking, such as what it means to be a social detective. The authors write, every one of us is a social detective. We are social detectives when we use our eyes, ears, brains, and hearts to figure out a situation. And here is an example of a social situation is illustrated in the book. We see three children in a school hallway. One of them has his face buried in a book and the other two are standing by. One of them is thinking, he never says hi. And the other is thinking, I think he's unfriendly. But it may not be that the boy with the book is trying to be unfriendly on purpose. There are other ways to interpret his behavior. Well, maybe he's shy. Maybe he's on the autism spectrum and doesn't know how to initiate a conversation. Or maybe he's worried about his math test that day and wants some extra study time. And on the next page, it says, social detectives and gather clues to make smart guesses about the situation. Unfortunately for children on the autism spectrum, they can do everything on this list and still make the wrong guess about the situation. I know I did that frequently as a child and it was very frustrating for me because I couldn't understand why I was getting it wrong. Anyway, her advice is to look around, think about the situation, ask yourself, do I know these people? Or are they strangers? Next, listen to what others are saying. And finally, think about what others are doing. And so, and the reason why books like this are important for all children, not just children on the autism spectrum, is that some children do have social learning deficits and the only way they can learn how to do social thinking in the right way is through direct training. And for the neurotypical children, they need to learn these social thinking ideas too. So they can understand that just like some children struggle to learn to read and some children struggle to learn math, there are other children who struggle to learn how to do social thinking in the right way. And if you happen to know one of those children, you should help them instead of shaming them and bullying them because Chances are they really don't know what it is they were doing it wrong. If they knew what they were doing wrong, they probably wouldn't be doing it. And another reason why this is important is because, well, if you walk into almost any library, you can find entire shelves filled with books about teaching them children to learn to read because we don't expect children to just naturally figure out for themselves how to read words printed on a page of a book. And yet somehow we have the attitude of, well, why do we need to teach children how to talk to each other? They just do it all the time, naturally by themselves. And yes, that is true for most children, 
but like I said, some children do have social thinking deficits and they struggle hard to understand these things and to understand why they can't understand. And for that reason, in order to increase understanding, which will hopefully in turn increase compassion, that it's important to teach these social thinking ideas to everyone. All right, that's all for today. Join us next time for another exciting review about another book about life on the autism spectrum. Everyone, that's our uh, program uh, for this time. Until next time, I'm Keith Halperin. I'm Will Burnick. I'm Stacey Kennedy. I'm Jennifer Brooks. I'm Michelle Garcia Winner. And we're Ascend TV, Life on the Autism Spectrum. Until next time, take care and be well. Thank you.